become a classic with a sales of a thousand. Uh, here's his statement. God's nature is revealed most perfectly in the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth as recorded in the New Testament. John Polkinghorne, the other professor of theoretical physics at Cambridge, uh, even now there are only two professors of theoretical physics at Cambridge. The system remains quite um, hierarchical. Um, and uh, here's his state, member of the Royal Society and everything else that a British scientist can be. Here's his statement, I take God very seriously indeed. I'm a Christian believer and believe that God exists and has made himself known in human terms in Jesus Christ. John Barrow, I know quite well. Uh, Barrow is now king of, king of the world at Cambridge. He's the successor to Polkinghorn. Uh, there, one of the most distinguished physicians in physics in, in the world. Uh, but I knew him a long time ago when we were when I was at Berkeley, and he was just a lecturer at the University of Sussex in uh, in England. But he would appear every January and February in Berkeley, and uh, and he would join in a, a Christian uh, faculty group that met once a week, and he was very quiet. Very, he was very quiet. I mean. It took me a long time to figure out this guy was brilliant, but I finally got it. He would open his mouth occasionally. And uh, uh, just a very interesting guy. Um, he wrote the book on the fine tuning of the universe, which I'll allude to in just a few minutes. Uh, his book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, he got the uh, Templeton Prize, one and a half million dollars. And this is his statement about that. I mean, I knew him to be a Christian uh, long before he became super famous. He says, I certainly don't believe there's some fundamental difference or conflict between a theistic or Christian perspective on the world and the practice of science. John Barrow, member in good standing of the um, Reformed Church in Cambridge. Uh, Alan Sandage just passed uh, the greatest observational cosmologist of the last third, maybe even the last half of the 20th century. Uh, never got the Nobel Prize, did get half a million dollars from the Swedish Academy of Sciences, not too bad. New York Times calls him the grand old man of cosmology, and he makes this statement in the Lightning Book, uh, which I don't completely agree with, uh, but it's interesting. He says, the nature of God is not to be found within any part of the findings of science. For that, one must turn to the scriptures. Well, in the Lightning Book, he says, can a person be a scientist and also be a Christian and read the book? And you'll see a lot of things he says. He says, yes, I am a Christian. And then he goes on to say why he became a Christian. He became a Christian at age 50, which is pretty unusual. I was my fourth year professor at Berkeley when I became a Christian, age 28, which is also a bit on the old side. Uh, and you just know why he became a Christian. He was down in the Atacama Desert, you know, the, the place where it's never rained and they have these incredible uh, telescopes. And he had some time on the telescope, and, and he took some time off, and he walked outside, and, and, and the atmosphere was pristine. He looked up, the stars were so amazing, he said, and he said to himself, God must exist. That's, that's the way it should have happened. That's not the way it happened. He said, biology made me do it. Now, this is the greatest observational cosmologist of the last half of the 20th century. He says, biology made me do it. He said, I'm a Christian. The world is too complicated in all its parts and interconnections to be due to chance alone. I'm convinced that the existence of life, with all its order in each of its organisms, is simply too well put together. Now, this is my friend Don Page. He's not a movie star, you can see here, uh, but he's a pretty cool guy, nevertheless. Uh, a true nerd, like me. And uh, Stephen Hawking's most famous student. This is how he fits into our story. Stephen Hawking's most famous student probably did the best collaborative work with Hawking, except for the singularity theorem. Um, perhaps Stephen Hawking's closest friend. When he was a postdoctoral, yeah, his PhD is from Caltech. When he was a postdoctoral fellow at Cambridge with Hawking, he lived in the Hawking household, 76 to 79. Hawking is deteriorating, and his job was to, it, within the household, was to get Stephen up in the morning and get him to work. Uh, so they, they became uh, very close. And uh, uh, Don is, uh, grew up in Alaska, he's a professor in Edmonton now, he thinks that's a warm climate. Um, he, uh, he sponsored an early version of this lecture, and uh, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Here's a statement that uh, 
that he made that one even sees uh, in the news media sometimes. And this is a little bit about his relationship with Stephen Hawking. This statement by Page is pretty well known. He says, I'm a conservative Christian in the sense of pretty much taking the Bible seriously for what it says. Of course, I know that certain parts are not intended to be read literally, so I'm not precisely a literalist, but I try to believe in the meaning I think it's intended to have. Now, I spoke about 11 o'clock in the morning in Alberta, and I was expecting lunch. Paige says, Schaefer, I've got some questions for you. Come on into my office. It was a small office. We were there until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. No lunch. No lunch. Um, he asked me a lot of questions, and he said a lot. Of, I asked him one question. I said, Don, you know, you're pretty famous for this statement. What do you mean? And I'm sure I'm not the first person to ask you this. What do you mean when you say you believe in the Bible, but you're not precisely a literalist? What does this mean? And he looks at me in astonishment. He says, Schaefer, I can't believe you don't understand this. Do you think that the psalmist, when he writes, um, God shelters his children under his wings, do you think the psalmist meant to imply that God is a big bird? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I couldn't resist that one very well. But I was able to tell him something interesting. Uh, is that in Marietta, Georgia, there is a big bird, a big chicken. And I showed him a picture of it, too. It's 150 feet tall, and the beak goes up and down, and the eyes roll. It's pretty amazing. I think everything in Atlanta is judged by where are you with respect to the big chicken. So uh, I was able to contribute a little bit to the, uh, to the discussion there. Um, I said to him, I said, Don, okay, give me something new. I mean, I've seen this before, and, and this has been in the New York Times and everywhere else. I've seen this before. Uh, I want something new. Here's what he gave me. This is his takeoff on the beauty principle. The beauty principle in science it goes something like this. Uh, if we have two theories uh, that equally well describe a set of experimental observations, the simpler theory is the better theory. That's the beauty principle. And for those who are philosophers, it's kind of like Occam's razor. So he says this, if the universe basically is very simple, which he dreams of, and Stephen Hawking dreams of, and the others do too, the theological implications of this would need to be worked out. Perhaps the mathematical simplicity of the universe is a reflection of the personal simplicity of the gospel message that God sent his son Jesus Christ to bridge the gap between himself and each of us, who have rejected God or rejected what he wants for us by rebelling against his will and disobeying him. And he says, you know, this is okay for uh, quantum cosmologists or for children. And that's what he gave me, and I, I like it. I like it. Chris Isham, uh, professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College London. Um, brilliant, is all I can say. Uh, Paul Davies, who writes a lot of, um, is a popularizer of science, pretty popular claimed that Isham is Britain's greatest quantum gravity expert. Now, what Stephen Hawking, Stephen Hawking is British, and what he does is quantum gravity. So this is a pretty small, this is a, uh, it's a great uh, uh, compliment. And uh, we don't have to engage in that discussion. We'll let other people decide who's best. Uh, but I asked, now he, uh, so he sponsored this lecture, early version of it, at Imperial College London. And uh, I spoke at about 11 o'clock, and he said, Schaefer, got a few questions I'd like to ask you. Can you come into my office? And, uh, and I'm saying to myself, you know, we've done this before. Uh, you know, this is this is done before, and there's going to be no lunch for me. This guy's going to drill me for, for five hours, and I'm going to walk out of there starving. Uh, he asked me questions for an hour, and we had a great lunch together. So it was a better experience than the one with Don Page. And I said to him the same thing I asked all these guys. Give me something I could share with, with a general audience, and he gave me this. He said, the God of Christianity is not only the ground of being, and now here he's alluding to Paul Tillich's description of God as the ground of all being, and uh, Isham says, that's not the whole story. God is also incarnate, and continues essential therein is the vision of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the new creation out of the old order, and the profound notion of the redemption of time, not just a brief history of time through the death, life, and death of Jesus Christ. Now, there's one last sentence that goes here that I want to, before I give it to you, I want you to be very cautious in, in jumping to a conclusion about it. You can easily take this out of context and get the wrong idea. His statement is, I think it will be rather a long time before theoretical physics has anything useful 
to add to that. So you could say, oh, you don't think theoretical physics is, is, uh, is important. I mean, that would be utterly wrong. I mean, Chris Eisner was totally, his entire professional life is, uh, has been committed to theoretical physics. He has a passion for, for theoretical physics. He's, what he's saying is that it was found in Christ. What he's found in Christ is more profound than, than anything in theoretical physics. Rick Smalley was a good friend of mine. He died uh, seven or eight years ago. The father of nanotechnology, Nobel Prize in chemistry in, uh, in 1996. Um, he was a skeptic, to put it mildly. No, he wasn't a skeptic, he was an atheist. And uh, we published two papers together in the journal of Chemical Physics in 1984. And actually, these, this was the most important work that Smalley did before he discovered Buckyball, C60, uh, the fullerene molecule in, in 19, uh, 1989. Uh, so we go back a long ways, and uh, he, uh, well, I don't want that yet. <laughs> he, uh, he would frequently make it clear to me that he wasn't buying any of this religious stuff. Um, I, when I described him in China, I said that Rick Smalley's was as staunch an atheist as Mao Zedong. And of course, the students are, you know, they're, when you say that, they're, they're, they're getting uncomfortable because, you know, they're supposed to worship Mao and they don't really do it. And, and they, you know, they're hoping there are any authorities watching their response. Uh, but the difference between the two of them is that, is that Rick Smalley was willing to consider the evidence and Mao was not. So here's his statement, Rick's statement. He comes a Christian about five years before his his death. He did buy a copy of my book. He did. You haven't mentioned that yet either. I did. I should have brought something to sell here. This would have been a great opportunity. But he'll, he'll pitch the book when we're done, right? You're going to do it. Okay. He bought a copy of my book. I don't know if that had any effect or not. But uh, this is his statement. Recently, I've gone back to church after being an atheist for 40 years with a new focus to understand as best I can what it is that makes Christianity so vital and powerful in the lives of billions of people today, even though almost 2,000 years have passed since the death and resurrection of Christ. Although I suspect I will never fully understand, I now think the answer is very simple. It's true. <laughs> His life was changed. It was really remarkable. Um, and this is a little bit more from Rick, which kind of fits in with our, our topic tonight. He said, God did create the universe about 13.7 billion years ago, and if necessity has involved himself with his creation ever since, the purpose of this universe is something that only God knows for sure, but it is increasingly clear to modern science that the universe was exquisitely fine-tuned to enable human life. We are somehow critically involved in his purpose, and then he makes a statement which needs a little polishing up uh, theologically, but it shows where his heart is. Uh, our job is to sense that purpose as best we can, love one another, and help him get the job done. Uh, he, uh, well, yeah, he's not a theologian, but he had a heart for Jesus Christ, I'll tell you. It was, it was an amazing change in his life. Okay, <clears throat> one uh, kind of concluding statement there, and then seven opinions of my own. Concluding statement. The Big Bang represents an immensely powerful and yet carefully planned and controlled release of matter, energy, space, and time. All this is accomplished within the strict confines of the very carefully fine-tuned physical constants and uh, laws. Uh, we've talked just briefly about this, and we can talk more in the questions. The power and care of this explosion, this Big Bang, reveals exceed human mental capacity by multiple orders of magnitude, and obviously, as a human being, one wants to ask the question, why? Okay, so I'll try to answer that question. Where do we go from here? People will go in different directions. Uh, this, is, this is where I'm coming from. First, the Creator must exist. <clears throat> the Big Bang ripples <clears throat> and the Wilkinson probe are clearly pointing to an ex nihilo from nothing creation event consistent with the first few verses of the book of Genesis. Second, this Creator must have awesome power and wisdom, <clears throat> the quantity of material and power resources within our universe are truly immense. The information or intricacy manifest in any part of the universe, and as I think Alan Sandage well said, and especially in a living organism, is beyond our ability to comprehend. And what we do see is only what God has shown us within the four dimensions of space and time that human beings inhabit. Third, <clears throat> the Creator is loving. The simplicity, balance, order, elegance, 
beauty seen throughout the creation demonstrate that God is loving rather than capricious. Fourth, this creator is just and requires justice, inward reflection and outward investigation, even thinking about a worldview. Affirm that human beings have a conscience. The conscience reflects the reality of right and wrong and the necessity of obedience. Uh, fifth, each of us is, uh, doesn't make it. Okay? Each of us falls hopelessly short of the Creator's standard. We incur His displeasure when we violate any part of God's moral law in our actions, our thoughts, and our words. Who can keep his or her thoughts and attitudes pure for even a moment? Uh, if each person fails short, falls short of his or her own standards, how much more so those of an all-holy God? Benjamin Franklin dealt with this question when he was 18, 17 or 18 years old. And my wife, uh, although her major at Stanford was art history, she, she likes regular history now, and she, she reads voraciously. And, and the good stuff she shares with me at night. And uh, so she shared with me this one passage from Ben Franklin's autobiography. Read the book, it's, it's really terrific. In which he decides at age 17 or 18 that he's going to be good for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, so he starts out, and it, it's, it's not working too well. And um, he decides the problem is delta T, mathematically. The time interval is too big, a lifetime. So it's, I, I'm just going to be good for a year. So he tries that for a little while. It's not working either. Goes to a month. Failure. Uh, a week. A, a, and it just doesn't work. So, you know, he really did begin to, uh, to understand uh, <clears throat> something about the nature of himself. Uh, sixth, because this creator is loving, wise, and powerful, he made a way to rescue us. When we come to a point of concern about our personal failings, as Ben Franklin did, we may begin to understand from the creation around us <clears throat> that God's love, wisdom, and power are sufficient to deliver us from this otherwise hopeless situation. Seven, and last, if we trust our lives totally to the rescuer, Jesus Christ, we will be saved. The one and only path is to give up all human attempts to satisfy God's requirements and to put our trust solely in Jesus Christ and in his means of redemption, namely his death on the cross. Thank you very much.